To this day, perched 1500 feet up Antarctica's second largest volcano, remains debris which has sat there for over 30 years, unable to be recovered. The frozen, smashed, twisted remnants of a once popular airliner serve as a stark reminder of the breathtaking yet unforgiving Antarctic terrain. This is the story of how a once in a lifetime experience transformed into the most deadly air crash and one of the darkest days for a prominent Pacific nation. Air New Zealand Flight 901 departs at 8.20 local time on the 28th of November 1979. It appears a regular Wednesday morning as the DC-10 departs with the sun rising over Auckland. But this is no ordinary flight. It's marketed as a once in a lifetime experience for passengers and crew. 901 is a specially organised sightseeing flight which will be flying low over Antarctica. Tickets cost a minimum of $359 New Zealand, equivalent to $900 US today. 237 passengers and 20 crew are on board the flight along with guide Peter Mulgrew, who has 20 years of Antarctic experience and will be sharing it with eager passengers. The DC-10's flight plan will track south via New Zealand's South Island, Auckland Islands, Balleny Islands, Cape Hallett, thence past Ross Island and overhead McMurdo Station. A return to New Zealand will be made via Christchurch to refuel, followed by a scheduled arrival time back in Auckland at 9pm. As the flight approaches the Antarctic coast, the aircraft will descend to a lower level, the highlight being a flyby of the towering Mount Erebus, Antarctica's second largest volcano with a summit of 12,448 feet. The DC-1030 Trijet is a wide-body airliner. It utilises the power of three engines and a range of 5,200 nautical miles. This particular flight will operate at 85% capacity, allowing passengers to move around the cabin easily to attain the best view. Captain James Collins is at the helm of the DC-10, an experienced operator with over 11,000 flight hours. He will be joined by First Officer Greg Casson and Flight Engineer Gordon Brooks for the Antarctic portion of the flight. Air New Zealand's Antarctica flight has been running since 1977 and this is the first time Captain Collins and First Officer Casson have flown this sector. However, they're both experienced pilots and considered qualified for the task at hand, with a special briefing being provided for them 19 days earlier. General weather observations for the McMurdo area released on the morning of the flight describe an overcast layer of cloud with a base of 3,500 feet with snow falling and a light wind. Topographical charts in McMurdo were delivered to the flight deck just prior to departure. A number of air traffic services will be available for the crew of 901 as they approach the Antarctic coast, including an air traffic controller based at McMurdo Station, via very high frequency and backup high frequency radio. The captain entered the flight plan into the aircraft's inertial navigation system prior to departure. INS was a commonly used navigation system for airliners before GPS became prominent. After calibrating at a node point, it utilises motion sensors and gyroscopes to continuously dead reckon the position of the aircraft. This allows for relatively accurate navigation, with maximum errors up to 2 miles per hour. Approaching top of descent, all appropriate briefings and checklists are complete and the flight crew are ready to make their descent. I think we'll start down early here. OK, I'll see if I can get hold of VHF. The first officer contacts McMurdo Air Traffic Control for a weather update. They're advised of overcast cloud at 2,000 feet with snow falling. Visibility below the cloud, however, is 40 miles. The forecaster adds that there are clear areas 75 to 100 miles to the northwest. We have a low overcast in the area at about 2,000 feet, and right now we're having some snow, but visibility is still about 40 miles. And if you like, I can give you an update on where the cloud areas are around the local area. 901, this is the forecaster again. It looks like the clear areas around McMurdo area are at approximately between 75 and 100 miles to the northwest of us. But right now over McMurdo, we have pretty extensive low overcast. Over. That'll be around Cape Bird, wouldn't it? Right, right. 
Got a low forecast over McMurdo. Doesn't sound very promising, does it? The flight engineer is pointing out here that the low cloud will cover Cape Bird, the exact area of where the planned site scene will take place. McMurdo comes in again advising they can guide the crew down to 1,500 feet once they are within 40 miles. The station at McMurdo has a radar which can be used by air traffic control to guide aircraft safely to low altitude, clear of terrain. However, when 901 continues past 40 miles, it will never be identified on radar by ATC. Within range of 40 miles of McMurdo, we have radar that will, if you desire, let you down to 1,500 feet on radar vectors. Over. Roger, New Zealand 901. That's acceptable. Several minutes later, the aircraft is now descending through 18,000 feet, 43 miles to the north of McMurdo. The captain spots an opening in the clouds which he can descend through, and the FO requests this from air traffic control. The first officer uses the HF radio for this transmission, as the VHF coverage is becoming intermittent. I'll have to do an orbit here, I think. We'd like further descent, and we could orbit in our present position, which is 43 miles north, descending in VMC. Two minutes later, the captain makes an announcement to the passengers. Captain again, ladies and gentlemen. We're carrying out an orbit, and circling our present position, and we'll be descending to an altitude below cloud so that we can proceed to McMurdo Sound. Captain Collins views it as advantageous to get below the cloud here, both from a passenger enjoyment perspective as well as reduced workload for the flight crew. Once clear of cloud and visual with terrain, the flight crew will have a much easier job of manoeuvring around McMurdo Sound and Ross Island for what should be a scenic flight. The crew discover that there is a problem with the aircraft's transponder which is not communicating the aircraft's position with McMurdo's radar. It seems to be resolved for now, however. Transponder is now responding. An inaudible message comes in from McMurdo. The first officer responds. Roger 901, you are now loud and clear also. We are presently descending through flight level 130 VMC, and the intention at the moment is to descend to 10,000. The first officer once again loses contact through VHF. Still preoccupied with keeping the aeroplane in visual conditions, Captain Collins commences a left turn as the aeroplane descends through 10,000 feet. I've got to remain visual here, so I'll be doing another orbit. 901, still negative, contact on VHF. We are VMC and we'd like to let down on grid 180 and proceed visually to McMurdo. New Zealand 901, maintain VMC. Keep us advised of your altitude as you approach McMurdo. We're VMC around this way, so I'm going to do another turn in. Sorry, I haven't got time to talk. Still seemingly under a high workload, the captain makes a second left turn to continue the approach. Rolling wings level, the crew spots land ahead. The captain commands the autopilot to re-intercept the flight plan track into the McMurdo area. The aircraft, now below the cloud, commences final descent down to 2,000 feet. Photos taken by passengers show landmarks visible up to 13 miles away. Unbeknown to the crew, they are now headed directly for Ross Island and Mount Erebus, on descent and already well below the summit of the volcano. Visibility from the cabin is poor, so Antarctic guide Peter Mulgrew joins the crew on the flight deck. As the first officer works the radios, the captain and Mulgrew make plans for the sightseeing portion of the flight. New Zealand 901, 50 miles north, the base was 10,000. We are now at 6,000, descending to 2,000, and we're VMC. We had a message from the Wright Valley, and they are clear over there, so if you can get us over that way... No trouble. This is Peter Mulgrew speaking, folks. I still can't see very much at the moment. Keep you informed as soon as I see something that gives us a clue as to where we are. We're going down in altitude now, and it won't be long before we get quite a good view. As the conversation continues, the flight engineer appears to be growing concerned about the terrain in the area. 
While the crew believe they are now over the ice-covered ocean in McMurdo Sound, they have yet to spot any identifying landmarks. Where's Erebus in relation to us at the moment? Left, about 20 or 25 miles. Yep, yep. I'm just thinking of any high ground in the area, that's all. I think it'll be left. Yes, I reckon it's about here. Yes, no, no, no. I don't really know. Confusion in the flight deck grows as the crew discover they may not in fact be in the area that they thought they were. I don't like this. Have you got anything from him? No. We'll have to climb out of this. You're clear to turn right. There's no high ground if we do a 180. No negative. As Ross Island and the gigantic Mount Erebus come into clear view, it's already too late for the crew to take evasive action. The captain requests go-around power from all three engines. Four GPWS warnings alert the crew of the rising terrain. However, it's too late. Air New Zealand Flight 901 collides with Erebus, 1500 feet above sea level. Shortly after the accident, McMurdo Station attempts to contact the flight again. When comms cannot be established, search and rescue teams are placed on standby and Air New Zealand headquarters in Auckland notified. Later in the night, half an hour after Flight 901 is due to run out of fuel, Air New Zealand informed the press that the flight is lost. At 12.55am, the US Navy discover the wreckage of Air New Zealand Flight 901, confirming all 237 passengers and 20 crew members have been killed. Almost immediately, one key question is asked of the fully serviceable aircraft and crew. Why couldn't the crew visually make out and avoid the second highest volcano in Antarctica? Whiteout is identified as one of the probable factors. It occurs in ice-covered areas where light refracts through ice crystals to create an extremely bright environment, turning the sky completely white. Combined with overcast cloud, this creates a horizon which is almost impossible to distinguish. A fake horizon can even be perceived when viewing a small gap between clouds. While with light shining from all directions, virtually no shadows form, making it extremely difficult to visually determine height above terrain as well as detect any changes in elevation. As Flight 901 approached Mount Erebus, the crew most likely did not detect any rising terrain once they levelled off from their final descent. The situational awareness of the crew may have also been affected by distraction. The FO was heavily preoccupied with rectifying issues with the VHF radio and maintaining contact with McMurdo Air Traffic Control. He made a number of transmissions over the backup HF frequency. And in the final minutes leading up to the accident, the entire crew seemed preoccupied and disorientated as they attempted to identify landmarks either side of the aeroplane. Amongst the confusion, and in combination with the hazardous whiteout effect, the crew did not notice Mount Erebus coming into view directly in front of them. This explains why the Air New Zealand crew didn't take any evasive action until it was too late. What would take over a year to uncover was how the aircraft could be on such a hazardous flight path in the first place. The crew were fully expecting, and documentation they received at the briefing weeks earlier showed that the flight plan track would direct the aircraft straight down the middle of McMurdo Sound, over 20 miles away from Mount Erebus. A reasonable margin, even accounting for INS error. However, this issue was mostly dismissed as the first official accident report was released on the 12th of June 1980, compiled by New Zealand's Chief Inspector of Air Accidents, Ron Chippendale. It primarily focused on pilot error and cited this as the primary cause of the accident. The blame was attributed to Collins for flying below the certified safe altitude of 6,000 feet for the McMurdo area. The approval which Air New Zealand had to operate the Antarctica flight only allowed aircraft to descend to 16,000 feet on the leg to McMurdo, with descent to 6,000 feet being permissible in clear weather conditions and in coordination with air traffic control. While these altitudes were set out in writing, they were certainly not always adhered to. We still don't know whether Captain Collins wasn't aware of these limiting altitudes or simply ignored them. A number of passenger photos from previous flights do show flight at altitudes well below 6,000 feet to allow for a better view. And even marketing from Air New Zealand pictured flights operating well below the approved 6,000 feet. There is at least some level of normalisation of deviance which has occurred here, with both Air New Zealand management and the pilot group accepting deviations from standard operating procedures. While this cannot completely exonerate Collins from descending below an approved minimum safe altitude, 
It can explain that he may have done so under the presumption that, while not completely by the book, it was safe and accepted to do so. With high public interest and criticism of the first official accident report, a further inquiry was made by High Court Judge Justice Peter Mann. This inquiry went on to uncover the series of events which led to 901 strains so disastrously off course. Back when the Air New Zealand Antarctica flights first started in 1977, a flight path was plotted and approved which would take the aircraft directly over the top of Mount Erebus and the McMurdo non-directional beacon, situated next to an ice runway. After the first two flights, this track was moved slightly west to take the flight over the western slopes of Mount Erebus. Management assumed that these tracks were mainly used as a guide to get the aircraft into the McMurdo area. The sightseeing side of the flight gave captains the flexibility to manoeuvre as they desired. As a new computerised system was introduced to manage Air New Zealand flight plans, the lat long position was required to be entered for each waypoint. Critically, a typo was made for this McMurdo waypoint, with longitude being entered as 164 degrees 48.0 minutes east, rather than the actual position of 166 degrees 48.0 minutes east. This error would have indirect, yet tragic, consequences. The McMurdo waypoint was moved into the middle of McMurdo Sound, initially making the flight plan safer over the ice-covered ocean. Unaware that the flight plan had been altered, flights over the next 14 months flew along this new route. Even pre-flight material was amended to show the new, incorrect track. Air New Zealand would claim after the crash that no one knew that the Antarctica flights were not being operated along the approved route. One man who did notice a discrepancy was the captain of the Antarctica flight three weeks prior to the accident. Captain Leslie Simpson discovered that once his flight arrived overhead the McMurdo waypoint, he was not actually overhead McMurdo station. Using the aircraft distance measuring equipment, he found that the ice runway at McMurdo was 26 miles away from the McMurdo waypoint. In an effort to make other pilots aware of this inconsistency, Simpson informed Air New Zealand management. A request was then made to the navigation department to move the McMurdo waypoint back to the original position. In the early hours of the morning before Captain Collins was due to take off, this change was made in the Air New Zealand computer system. The McMurdo waypoint was moved 26 miles east, now in accordance once again with the approved route. Critically, Captain Collins was never made aware of this change and neither were any of the flight crew. While his briefing material showed that he would be tracking over the ocean, the airplane's computers were now programmed to take him on a collision course with Mount Erebus. The alteration may have been picked up when cross-checking lat-long information on topographical maps of the area. However, these were only delivered to the flight deck minutes before departure. A change in the flight plan would usually be queried by air traffic control. However, the waypoint entry on the route submitted to ATC simply stated the word McMurdo. The controller at McMurdo Station would have noticed New Zealand 901 descending on a collision course with Mount Erebus. However, he was never able to identify 901 on radar. While the aircraft's transponder, which transmits position information, and the radar at McMurdo were both fully functional, it was discovered after the crash that the DC-10's transponder was set to standby, meaning that the transponder was powered but not producing a signal. Justice Mann's report was released on the 27th of April 1981 and exonerated the crew of all blame for the accident. The High Court judge explained that the most significant factor contributing to the accident was the alteration of the coordinates in the navigation computer, resulting in a collision course with Mount Erebus. He also pointed towards the whiteout conditions as a major contributor in misleading the crew, with a malevolent trick of the polar light. Mann also criticised their New Zealand management, accusing them of creating an orchestrated litany of lies in an attempt to cover up the errors made by their ground staff in the navigation department. The crash of Air New Zealand Flight 901 remains to this day the deadliest air crash in New Zealand history. The event accelerated the retiring of the Air New Zealand DC-10 fleet, with most being replaced by Boeing 747s by the end of 1982. Air New Zealand Antarctica flights were cancelled after Flight 901, while the only other operator of Antarctica sightseeing flights, Qantas, would suspend flights in February 1980, though Qantas would return on a limited basis in 1994, with charter flights which continue to this day. Almost all the wreckage of 901 remains on the slopes of Mount Erebus, with recovery operations not possible due to the remote location and hazardous weather conditions. With the amount of redundancy and procedures designed to promote safety in aviation, 
An accident only occurs when several factors line up perfectly to produce a catastrophe. It is exceedingly rare that one single failure of the system can lead to a crash. In the case of Air New Zealand Flight 901, the adjusting of the flight path without the captain's knowledge was one of the primary causes. However, the young lucky combination of weather, visual illusion, distraction, and incorrect configuration of aircraft equipment all came together to lead to disaster. If just one of these factors was removed, the flight would have continued and landed back in Auckland safely. Perhaps this is the most sobering fact to reflect on in reviewing the journey of Air New Zealand Flight 901.